Hey everybody, Rhino here, the world's strongest pro bodybuilder and inventor of the cooler. The world's only cooler that holds a gallon of ice water and keeps your pre and post workout drinks all together inside one ice cold container. I have a confession to make. In 2009, when I set my first powerlifting world record, I'd never heard of Louis Simmons or West Side Barbell, and I've still never met him or talked to him. Before I met Mark Bell, I'd only ever competed in two powerlifting meets, one in 1996 and the second in the spring of 2009. I was just a bodybuilder that lifted heavy weights. I deadlifted 782 pounds in my first competition with no belt or straps way back in 1996. No coaching, no internet, and no program. My training partner was a 16-year-old kid who could pull over 700 pounds. We just lifted until we shit a spleen, ate until we couldn't walk, and slept the rest of the time. The first box squat I ever performed was with Mark Bell, six weeks before my competition. The first band squat and safety bar squat I ever did was also with Mark Bell. And the first time I ever did chains or pin presses was at that same time. And we only did those a few times during that prep. I'll be honest, I've never once used a percentage of one rep max, max model. And when someone says they benched 400 times two times five, I still don't know if that's two sets of five or five sets of two. Until last month, I had no idea what the hell an AMRAP was. Sounds like a breakfast burrito, AMRAP. As many reps as possible. There's nothing new about that. AMRAP sets have been around for a hundred years, but we just called it failure. I've been doing that at the end of every workout for 30 years and tens of thousands of lifters have been doing that for 30 years before I ever picked up a weight. And the acronym EPOC, Excess Post Exercise Oxygen Consumption. We just called that hard work. Where I'm from, if you weren't tired when you were done training, you didn't train, you were just exercising. I'm not sure when it became necessary to start renaming everything, but I'm sure it's so trainers can create the illusion that they're original or cutting edge. It's nothing worse than someone regurgitating something they read in a book or saw on the internet when they've never done it themselves. Or someone coining a new phrase to try and repackage and sell you something that's already been done for 50 years. And there's nothing worse than someone who's never accomplished anything noteworthy in any competitive athletics, barfing up an opinion about what works and what doesn't work or whose program is best when they've never done it. I'm not saying you have to be a world record holder to coach. But you do have to try like hell for many years and realize some modicum of success beyond high school. Reading about it and watching someone else do it doesn't make you an expert. Your exercise science degree means nothing to a bar that's loaded with 800 pounds. You have to experience success and failure. You have to suffer. You have to hit plateaus and overcome them. You have to have been injured and rehabilitated yourself and returned to be better than before. You have to have been humbled you have to have reached and exceeded your goals. You have to learn from personal experience and you have to help dozens or hundreds of others achieve their goals, not by copy and pasting their program, but by being able to figure out why they've stopped progressing and help them through those plateaus. Now let's be clear. I think I'm a pretty knowledgeable athlete and coach, but Louis Simmons has forgotten more about powerlifting than I'll ever know. He's spent a lifetime committed to the sport. And if you've read much of his work, there's a lot of well thought out information accumulated from 40 years of coaching and competing. Of course, if you pick through anybody's entire life body of work, it's not hard to single out things that you'll disagree with or don't work for you. But Louis's contribution and commitment to the sport is unquestionable. Now that having been said, I don't think most beginner and intermediate lifters really understand what truly makes Westside lifters so successful. I see them arguing over all the various aspects of Westside programming and comparing and contrasting it to many of the other popular programs out there like Juggernaut, the Bulgarian system, 531, the Cube, etc. After reading all those programs and speaking and training with many of their creators and talking to lots of the Westside lifters, I believe the real secret to their success is they just worked harder. They were in a savage gym with a savage coach surrounded by savage lifters and they trained like savages. I'm sure you're starting to see recurring themes in many of these rants that were all the easy 
gains are gone after the first three to six months. And the real work begins as you get closer and closer to your goal or hit your first plateau. The next level gets harder and harder to achieve. And no supplement's gonna solve that problem. No fancy program's gonna solve that problem. Ultimately, it's gonna come down to how hard are you willing to work? How much are you willing to sacrifice? The vast majority of time, people drastically overestimate how hard they work. Or they confuse a lot of work with hard work. And they're not the same. Most just start making excuses and blaming everyone and everything else as the reason for their lack of progress. Blame genetics, blame the coach, blame the judges, blame your training partner, blame your finances, blame your elbow. I've said before, a great coach and a great training partner or team can be huge for your progress. But I really believe it's less about the nuances of the program and more about their ability to get the absolute most out of you. A great coach could give two shits about your feelings and will quickly tell you where you're screwing up and challenge you every day. A great training partner will step on your neck to crush you in the gym because it's the survival of the fittest. And if he can't beat you, he sure as hell isn't gonna step on the platform with Eric or Andre or Chad or Dan. And I believe all those guys I just mentioned would still be amazing lifters if they used any of a dozen different training programs because they all train like savages. Now to be clear, a plan is better than no plan. A program is better than no program. Having a goal is better than no goal. But I don't think the programs themselves are the difference between a champion and an also ran. It's the intangibles that make the difference. Consistency, intensity, discipline, hard work, pain. At some point, whatever program you're doing isn't gonna keep working and you're simply gonna to have to make changes along the way. No special blend of sets and reps is gonna cut it, and you're simply gonna to have to train harder, eat better, sleep better, and recover better. And the harder you train, the more you have to eat, sleep, and recover, which makes you able to train even harder, which requires you to eat, sleep, and recover even more. And that cycle continues until you quit or get injured, because ultimately, the iron always wins. Now, I believe the best of the best train instinctively. They know what their body's capable of, and they modify whatever program they're doing and constantly strive to achieve more. The vast majority of times somebody tells me that they have hit a plateau, it's not some minor problem or programming issue. It's a big obvious one. They look past in search of a more complex answer. It's not their percentage load or split or set rep scheme or the protein powder or creatine or which knee sleeves they're wearing. The reason it's important for me to talk about this topic is because I find so many young athletes these days searching for the best program or the best technique or the best diet or best steroid cycle and they're never gonna find the answer there. Most of the time, it's either a bad diet where they're not consistently getting enough calories to fuel growth or poor sleep, which can be the result of bad sleep habits or sleep apnea or it's an injury or a mobility issue they haven't properly addressed because foam rolling is the extent of their rehab knowledge. Or it's a major strength imbalance in a muscle chain that they hate training because they can't see it in the mirror. Or they're not good at it or get bored with the exercises necessary to bring up the weakness. Or they've been doing the same routine forever. Or they greatly overestimate their training intensity because they work harder than their training partner and have no idea what it's like to train with real savages or their egos take over and they just prefer being the strongest guy in their gym. I never understood that because I was always searching for someone that was better than me, that could challenge me. Hell, when Eric Spoto came over to my house to train with me, I couldn't even be the strongest guy in my own garage. Now, when I trained with Flex Wheeler, he didn't reach into a bag of tricks. He just stuck with what works. He and the vast majority of the savages did before and after his time. He showed up twice a day made me work harder than I'd ever worked before. He didn't starve me with egg whites, tilapia, and broccoli. He fed my muscles with eight meals a day, four pounds of steak, 800 grams of carbs, and we burned the fat off with hard work, moving tons of weight, not walking on a treadmill. It's called body building for a reason, not body shrinking. Marius Pujanowski ate 10 eggs and half a, uh, half a pound of bacon for breakfast every morning. Some minor technique adjustment or micronized creatine is not what's holding you back. 
Try training like Marius for a month and see where that gets you. Now, when I trained with Mark, we didn't have a spreadsheet for percentages and check boxes, and we didn't write down every rep or set. We just went to war every time we trained with some of the strongest guys on the planet. Ask anyone who's ever trained with me, I'm there to win. Fuck waiting for the platform. The real competition's in the gym. And anyone's ever said that you don't have to get sore to succeed has never succeeded. If you've never limped out to the parking lot and had to hold on to something to step off a curb, you don't train hard. If you've never drove home and couldn't bend your legs to get out of the car, you don't train hard. If you've never walked down the stairs sideways, both feet touch, touching every step while holding on to a rail, you don't train hard. And if your entire body has never seized up your abs, quads, or hamstrings, waking up in the middle of the night, screaming in pain, you don't train hard. And that should tell you all you need to know about competitive powerlifting. You can look under every rock for the search of the secret, but the answer is inside of you already. Are you willing to work that hard? Are you willing to suffer that much? Are you willing to sacrifice that much? The answer to that question is where you'll find your next PR. Do you have to train like that every workout year round? Nope. Even the GOAT, Eddie Cohn, only competed twice a year, and he incorporated hypertrophy training and progressive overload with deload weeks to keep his body from adapting and getting stale. But everything had a purpose. He said in his book, there's only one reason to go to the gym, and that's to get better. Am I saying that technique isn't important? Nope. But I've seen plenty of guys with perfect form that can't squat or pull over 500. And I've also seen plenty of guys with shit form that can squat and pull over 700. So what is perfect form anyhow? Pete Rubish was routinely criticized all over social media for bad form. Everyone claiming he was gonna break his back, blah, blah, blah. Now that he's deadlifting 900 pounds, people are copying his form, paying him for programs, inviting him to speak at seminars. I think it's hilarious. Pete isn't one of the strongest deadlifters in the world because of his form. It's because he's been training like an absolute savage for years, not just on the major lifts, but on all of his accessory work, it's equally as insane. Now Pete's form is different than KK's form, which is different than Milanichev's form, which is different than Brian Shaw's form, which is different than Misha's or Dan Green's, but they each found what works for them. And the only thing consistent about all of them is they've trained like savages for a decade or two or three. It's hard not to sound like a crotchety old man that complains about every new thing that comes along, but. If they promise results without hard work, then it's bullshit. I often talk about certain lifters that are mutants, and they're often referred to as being gifted. And I know firsthand about this, because I've trained with many of the greatest lifters in the world, and it just boggles my mind how strong they are. All these gifted athletes, like Benedict Magnuson, Andre Milanichev, KK, they've spent thousands of hours under massive amounts of weight. Eric Lillibridge may be young, but he's been lifting since he was nine and competing since he was 14. If you look at total hours under the bar, Eric's worked twice as hard as I have, and he's done it under the watchful eye of a great coach, his father Ernie, and, a, and is competing with his dad and brother every day for a decade. People who start a program or set a goal or select a date for their competition also tend to plug many of the gaping holes in their game at the same time. In the strength game, one plus one equals five. The more disciplines you improve, the more results you realize. They tend to sleep better, eat better, implement a recovery program, and simply start to train harder. People ask me all the time if I'm gonna compete again, and I just repeat what I, I heard Eddie Cohen say one time. I just don't wanna work that hard anymore. I don't wanna go through that much pain. Many times I've done seminars, I've spent two hours talking about training and diet and answering dozens of questions, and I've sat back in my chair and reflected on all the things that I've discussed. And I take a long look at the audience and I take a deep breath and I just say, you know what? At the end of the day, the best just wanted it more. They just sacrificed more. They just suffered more. And that's the message I really think that gets lost in all the debates over the details. You wanna be a savage? Ditch the beast mode hat and selfies and start training like a savage. The bar is loaded. Shut up and squat. Well, that's my rant. And as always, thanks for listening.